what I'm going to talk about today is uh, just an introduction to the the, uh, the impact based warnings project in uh, uh, that's taking place in the central region this year. We did a demo in uh, in, in two states, uh, Kansas and Missouri, last year, and uh, you know I'll cover you know some of the rationale behind it, um, uh, some of the social science ramifications, and uh, toward the end a little example uh, from the Henryville, Indiana tornado, which. Uh, um, provides a good opportunity to see how this all works. What IBW is, is it's really a, a very simple but, but important change to the uh, our existing warning system. The content of our tornado warnings hasn't changed much in, in 50 years. We, we actually went back and looked at what warnings looked like in 1972, and they're, they're pretty pretty similar to what we do now. So this, this is representing a, a first step, really, in, in the evolution of these warnings to provide a better service. And that's, this was part of uh, the Joplin recommendation was to provide a, a gradual evolutionary process to move our warnings forward, uh, try to make it more effective. Uh, what it's not is uh, it shouldn't be misrepresented as a, an evolutionary leap. There, there's some, uh, as Ken Cook describes, uh, describes them as backbenchers, which have, they, they've kind of said, well, we're turning the warning system upside down. And that's, that's not the case at all. It's a very minor step. And as you can see on the slide here, it's just really basically one change in two parts. It's the addition of a uh, uh, a tier to our tornado warnings, um, a considerable damage threat warning tier for significant tornadoes, approximately two or greater. And then we're also adding concise wording on impacts and, and risk that's commensurate with those threats. So that's all there is. We're just adding a tier to try to ring the bell a little bit louder for when we think these, these more significant events are going to occur. Also, what it's, what it's not is the ability to issue a tornado emergency. That's, that's gotten a lot of, uh, a lot of press. Uh, but this has been in our, our, uh, our, our directives for quite some time and in our toolbox for many years. Uh, the tornado emergency remains there, and we've added a damage threat indicator uh, tag of catastrophic to the tornado emergency to, to fit the IBW format. But you know, we'll, we'll address that a little bit later. We'll also address um, uh, the ability to issue a tornado possible damage threat indicator tag in a severe thunderstorm warning. Uh, that will come later in the presentation. So right now I'm going to address like three basic rationales for, for moving ahead with the IBW project. And this is probably the most important one right here. Uh, you know, Why should we do this? Well, the numbers say that we should. Um, you can see here these stats are from uh, are compiled from the last five years in the central region only. Um, it's a pretty good sample size. The number of tornadoes uh, during that time was uh, uh, a little bit over 3,000. Uh, of those, 2,800 were EF0 to EF1. And you can see the stats here. 13% of, uh, uh, of all tornadoes in the central region were EF2 to EF5, resulting in 97% of all fatalities. Uh, 87%, uh, like I mentioned, are EF0 to EF1, uh, resulting in just seven fatalities, or 3%. And, and all seven of those fatalities were from EF1 tornadoes. So you can see, you know, this is this is rationale number one. It's probably the most important, like I mentioned. Um, societal needs demand that tornado warnings emphasize high-impact events, those most likely to do serious harm. And if we're serious about reducing tornado deaths, this is where we should start. So this is kind of the, the main basis of the IBW project. Uh, all tornadoes are not the same, and kind of by, by treating uh, tornadoes as a, as a one size fit, fits all, you know, where by default, because most tornadoes and tornado warnings, most tornadoes are small, and tornado warnings are, uh, uh, most of them are false alarms. We're by default emphasizing warnings for weak tornadoes at the expense of warnings for life-threatening tornadoes, and, and that's a flaw in our current warning paradigm. Second rationale is well because public and partners say we should do that, and this this stems from uh, from our service assessments. Not just 2011, we've actually looked at uh, uh, service assessments from Lubbock, the Lubbock tornado in 1970, uh, the Super Tuesday outbreak of 2008, Mother's Day of 2008, and of course Joplin and uh, the Southeast U.S. outbreaks of 2011. A lot of the findings were, from those were pretty similar. In fact, that Lubbock uh, 1970 uh, uh, service assessment was the first one to mention that sirens, you know, should have a different tone for uh, for higher end tornadoes, just a different way of alerting the public to something more significant that's going on. 
And, and this is a common theme in a lot of these service assessments that, that most people identify local siren systems, even even in 2011 uh, when we did the, the Joplin assessment, most identify these siren systems as their first source of warning. But perception still exists that sirens go off all the time and nothing happens. Um, and this is generally what people experience. It's uh, There's an optimism bias. And also, the, you know, people tend to self-calibrate their responses to warnings. And if, if sirens go off all the time and nothing happens, they're a little bit slower to take action. And this is also something we found in these service assessments, that most seek confirmation first from additional sources before they seek shelter. Uh, also, extraordinary risk signals are what prompt people to take action. And currently, there's no mechanism to elevate the threat in, in NWS tornado warnings. And IBW is trying to address that. Um, another important finding is our polygonology, which, which is also being addressed. Our existing dissemination systems aren't, aren't compatible uh, with storm-based warning polygons. And there can be confusion when there's multiple polygons in a jurisdiction like a county. Uh, there, there can be confusion over where the actual threat is. So this is rationale number two. Uh, clear and credible risk communication is necessary for people to take uh, immediate protective action. The well, third rationale is is pretty simple. Uh, you know, tornadoes, as far as as far as I know, anyway, are the the only hazard whereby NWS does not include an expected magnitude as part of the warning message. Uh, and these are just some examples. What if we issued a flood warning for the Red River in Fargo, but refused to say how high the river stage would get, or telling the air traffic controller at O'Hare there'd be fog, but refused to give them a predictive visibility, and so on and so forth. So. You know, tornadoes are like any other hazard, and, that, and they require expressions of magnitude to elicit the most appropriate actions, and that's the third rationale. At this point, I'll, I'll kind of address some of the uh, some of the concerns that have been expressed about IBW. There's actually a couple of them that, that you hear more often than others. First of all, this is probably the one that we hear the most is uh, the IBW will result in a diluted public response for, for base tornado warnings. Uh, you know, it would take years of study to find that out. But, you know, we, we do know that uh, IBW now places emphasis on those tornadoes likely to do the most serious harm, and that, that our emergency managers have told us that corrects a, uh, uh, a critical da gap in our existing tornado warning paradigm. Uh, if there is a trade-off, we believe it's the correct one. Um, if public response for base tornado warnings is diluted, it's extremely likely that it would be less than response levels for severe thunderstorm warnings. And uh, as it turns out, mortality rates from EF0 to EF1, as we saw in the earlier slides, are, are roughly equivalent to that from severe thunderstorm winds. Uh, in fact, mortality rates from severe thunderstorm winds are actually a little bit higher than for from EF0 to EF1s. So, you know, we feel like our, the response to our tornado warnings has already been diluted to a pretty low baseline. Um, and people, like I said, you know, they tend to self-calibrate their responses to, to weather alerts, and, and there's an optimism bias in that people think, you know, disasters are more likely to happen to other people than themselves. So, you know, what we don't want people to do is self-calibrate their responses to low event, low end events only to be caught unaware when, when the high end event comes. Um, I know that you know some pundits out there have called IBW kind of a, a dangerous path because of the perception that response to low-end tornadoes will be diluted. But you know we're arguing just the opposite that you know the status quo is a more or more dangerous path for its failure to emphasize these big high-end tornado events. Probably the second thing that, that we hear the most of uh, as far as concerns about IBW is that we don't have the skill to discern uh, large tornadoes from small or, or no tornadoes. Um, but, but frankly, the, you know, the ADAD is designed for this task. You know, what we're trying to do is you know, they're, they're generally pretty obvious events. When you see these on radar, you know something big is happening, and you know, it should be, actually be a little bit easier than, than, than what we do uh, right now. Um, ADAD is not designed for detecting you know, small tornadoes that, that often occur below the spatial and, and temporal resolution of the radar. 
And you can see these stats here on the slide, which show the, the probability of detection uh, for you know, small tornadoes, about 69%. And then you run it up to, uh, for larger tornadoes, EF3 to EF5, and the POD jumps incredibly to, to 94%. So, you know, this shows that the ADAD is designed for that task. So, you know, we've known this for a long time, um, the ability to detect uh, larger tornadoes with the ADAD. But what we're more interested in this case is evaluating skill. And the simplest skill measure uh, for us to look at is a hit rate, which is essentially, you know, one minus the false alarm ratio. Uh, since 2008, uh, all tornado warnings uh, in central region, the hit rate is 28%, which is a pretty low number. Um, but we think that most of you know most of the false alarms that occur are are falling on the low end of the uh, of the tornado intensity scale. So you know prior to to 2012, uh, very few studies. You know we've looked around and we haven't seen hardly any studies at all. You know prior to uh, uh, the, the 2011 outbreaks that examine this skill in this discerning large tornadoes from smaller or no tornadoes. Um, and one of the reasons we decided to do it, you know, in the field, uh, this, this project, because in a laboratory setting, it's kind of hard to do. Um, you know, a lot of the warning inputs, like spider reports, are difficult to simulate. Um, but I know that recently, here in the last year or so, a couple of studies have come out on, uh, on relating uh, radar signatures to to high end tornadoes. So that's that's one good thing that's come out of the uh, um, the disasters of 2011. That there's a, a, a kind of a renewed focus on on uh, detecting and with skill these these large large end uh, tornadoes. Uh, and that's one of the primary benefits of the IBW project. It's you know we're we're going to try to evaluate our capacity for discerning the hazard magnitude of tornado warnings, and that that provides a baseline for future comparison. Uh, unfortunately, last summer when we did the demo project out in uh, Kansas and Missouri, it was a you know pretty small year. We need a larger sample size, but uh, it showed pretty promising inferences. But you know, like the slide says here, it was a, a pretty small sample size. We can't draw definitive conclusions from that, so we're kind of moving ahead uh, this year across the entire central region to get a bigger bigger sample size. So here are the numbers from uh, from the demo. Uh, again, just showing for comparison the hit rate from all central region tornadoes from 2008 to 2012. It was 28 uh, percent. The hit rate from the uh, the IBW project was 49 percent. Uh, so it was a little bit higher uh, in this particular case. There were 61 tornado events that occurred in the uh, the five WFO demo area and 82 tornado warnings. Uh, that were issued through December of 2012. I call these IBW to defined tornado warnings because you have the ability in IBW to upgrade um, a warning. You can have a base tornado warning, for instance, but you can upgrade to a considerable or catastrophic uh, damage threat indicator tag uh, using an SVS. And so that also, uh, that severe weather statement counts as an additional uh, tornado warning in the in the IBW uh, service-based approach that we're calling it. Okay, so what happens when we split this down into into categories? And you know, we're we're taking a look here. At the, you can see 51 tornado events occurred that were EF0 to EF1, and just 10 tornado events occurred that were EF2 or greater. Uh, typically, in uh, in those five WFOs in that region, they get in a year they get 17 EF2 or greater. So you can see it's just a little bit smaller than uh, than what is normal. Um, the hit rate for uh, when you break it down by categories like this, the hit rate for uh, EF0 to EF1 tornadoes was 49 percent, and the hit rate for the EF2 to EF5 category was 47 percent. So they're nearly identical. Uh, there were 15 tornado warnings that were issued with the considerable uh, damage threat indicator or higher tag, and seven of those verified uh, with an EF2 plus uh, event. So that's just your hit rate of 47% right there. So that means there were eight tornado warnings that verified with something less than uh, uh, than an EF2. So 
doing this in a, in a categorical type approach, it allows us, it affords us the opportunity to look at near misses. And so uh, that's what we've done here. If I go to the next slide real quick. You know, how many of those those eight tornado warnings that didn't didn't verify with an EF2 or greater actually verified with uh, either no tornado or an EF0 or an EF1? And of those eight, four of them actually had an EF1 occur in those. And then the, the remaining four were uh, uh, either no tornado, I think there was one event, and then three EF0s. So using these broadened categories like this for uh, uh, you can see that for the uh, the broadened range for hitting an EF0 to EF3 with no damage threat indicator tag rose slightly to 54%. But the, the big thing here was when you look at the broadened category for an EF1 to EF5 for when we use the uh, uh, the considerable damage threat indicator tag, the hit rate jumps up to 73%. So that's another way of saying, you know, a lot of those 15 tornado warnings, 11 resulted in EF1 or greater intensity. So that's that's a pretty good improvement over what we're looking at historically uh, concerning our, 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 our tornado warning hit rates. So just on that, that small sample size, that does give some indication that we do have skill in distinguishing these larger tornadoes from smaller tornadoes. This is a study that uh, uh, was done by uh, SPC uh, last year just uh, examining the relationship between uh, maximum rotational velocity on the 88D and uh, EF scale tornadoes. And this is not a small sample set. Um, uh, I can't remember. Greg, do you remember how many? Uh, uh, it's 1,700 tornadoes. 1,700 tornadoes. Yeah. That's, that's a pretty good size. Uh, and you can see on the left there is the uh, uh, rotational velocity in knots and then the EF scale here on the bottom. And you can see there's a clear positive relationship between rotational velocity and EF scale. Uh, over on the right-hand side there, they kind of group it into EF2s and 3s and then EF2s and 5s. And you can kind of see that same relationship uh, exists. And also on the right there, that little uh, that oval there, you can see that there's an overlap between essentially EF1s and, and EF2s and 3s, uh, which is similar to the results that we saw in the uh, demo project last year. Okay, at this point, I'll step a little bit into the social science -y stuff. I won't spend too much time on it, but this is the uh, uh, this equation here is, is the risk paradigm equation, where I think a lot of you have seen this before. Risk is actually a function of hazard character and excuse, excuse me and vulnerability. And what we're focusing on, obviously, is hazard character. This is this is what we do, um, predicting the. Uh, uh, or describing the probability of occurrence of a, of a hazard, the time of the occurrence, location of the occurrence, and importantly for tornado warnings, which we've, we've kind of ignored in the past, the magnitude and intensity of the hazard. The vulnerability part of the equation is something you know we can help with. We we do we mentioned vulnerabilities in our call to action statements, uh, things like if you're in a mobile home, do this; uh, if you're outdoors, do that. Uh, but by and large, the vulnerability part of the risk equation is uh, involves some personal responsibility from the user to know what their vulnerabilities are and to have a plan. Uh, so you know we can help with that that aspect, but really what we're trying to focus in on is describing the hazard character. These next few slides are, are actually from our social science group that's evaluating this project uh, uh, called Wexum, Weather for Emergency Managers. Uh, and this is kind of their their way of describing the, the, the risk paradigm, which is uh, a little bit different, but it's worth going through. Uh, outcome number one that they're looking at is is risk characterization. This is this whole e equation right here is how people manage their risk, and the first thing they're looking for is is how the risk is characterized. Uh, and this is what we found in Joplin too. People need clarity on impacts for their personal risk assessment. And the main two things that they were looking for were, does this affect me and how bad is it gonna be? So the next outcome is risk communications. And you know, this is the, uh, 
Um, obviously, you know, packaging and delivering of, of warnings, um, conveying the understanding of risk. This is really the, par- the prime public warning challenge for rapid onset events, such as tornado warnings. Um, the, the challenge is to convert people's natural perception of safety to a perception of risk. Uh, you know, previously I talked about uh, uh, people having an optimism bias, uh, a feeling that you know disasters happen to other people, not themselves. So that's that's kind of a barrier you have to get over when you uh, are are trying to communicate risk. Uh, you know, converting people's natural perceptions of safety to that perception of risk. And we're also trying to speed up risk assessment and protective action processes. Uh, in our interviews in Joplin, we found that people would, uh, and rightly so, they would look for additional information to confirm the threat, try to better understand the threat, and they would the risk assessment process could take up to nine steps. And one of our goals is to try to reduce that to get them to take action a little bit quicker. And then the last outcome is, uh, of course, risk management. Um, and this is the societal response part of the equation. And, and again, like I mentioned, we can help with vulnerability uh, descriptions to a degree via call to actions, but really it's personal responsibility that comes to play uh, into play at the end of this process. So in our, our social science group, um, when they went out and they, they spent most of their time talking to media and emergency managers in the, uh, in the aftermath of the demo project last fall, and they identified the six key areas of information that core, par- core partners focus on, um, and pretty much in this order of, uh, of importance. The threat and the magnitude, uh, they determined that IBW does provide much better information on threat and magnitude, as you might expect. Uh, timing, location, duration, history, and, uh, and confidence. Um, the ability to put these damage threat indicator tags in your warning is sort of a, an expression of confidence. And at least that's the way the, uh, uh, the emergency managers kind of interpreted that. Uh, their final report is out. It's, uh, I was looking for a URL for that, but I don't have it. But uh, if you contact Central Region Headquarters, they do have the final report uh, from the, uh, uh, the Wexham Group. Okay, here's an example of what an IBW tornado warning looks like. This is the Dexter tornado last year in southeast Michigan. Uh, and you can see this, there's a, uh, the tags at the bottom of the warning, which are, are probably one of the most important things. Uh, there's an observed tornado. Uh, the damage threat indicator is considerable, or we're expecting something larger than uh, uh, or an EF2 or, or greater tornado. Uh, up there at the top, this is a, uh, a, a PDS type situation, particularly dangerous situation. And then you can see kind of the, how the format has changed from the, uh, from the usual tornado warning. Um, it's kind of bulleted, mentioning the hazard, the source, and then the impact, which is commensurate with the, uh, the damage threat indicator tag. Okay, wait for this to come up a little bit. This slide here is uh, kind of kind of breaks it down of what what the tags look like in in the IBW project. You have a, a tag whether or not the tornado is radar indicated or observed. Emergency managers um, felt that you know an observed tornado tag was an expression of confidence, and they they wanted to know if it was observed or just radar indicated. Uh, the damage threat indicator tags. Uh, either no tag for your base tornado warning, which would be uh, roughly an EF0 to EF1, and uh, the uh, uh, considerable damage threat tag for uh, 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 damage of EF2 to EF5 expected. And these can be, you know, this is not necessarily uh, an observed tornado, but because these can be radar indicated as well. And then the, the, the final one there is a catastrophic tag, uh, which is for... Uh, uh, you've got substantial observed evidence of a violent tornado uh, impacting a, a population center. Uh, these are pretty rare. This is the we, we put some restrictions on, on when you can use the catastrophic tag, which I'll describe here in a, in a couple of slides. I'll describe it on this slide. <laughs> Um, like I said, this is the catastrophic damage threat indicator tags the, uh, for the tornado emergency. 
we put some uh, restrictions on its use to uh, address past misuse of the product. Believe it or not, there's actually, um, in the southern U.S., there was actually a couple, two or three false alarms with the uh, tornado emergency. In other words, a tornado emergency was issued, but no tornado had actually occurred at all. And that's something that it should never happen. So, you know, we're restricting the use of the tornado emergency to only when there's substantial visual evidence that a violent tornado is occurring and uh, that it'll, it'll imminently impact or nearly impact the population center. Uh, like I said, they should be exceedingly rare, never be issued on radar evidence alone. Um, this is something that will probably never happen in most people's careers. Um, but that is in the toolbox in case you ever decide to use it. Uh, in my opinion, most times a considerable damage threat tag suffices. I don't think there's a wrong choice when you have uh, you know, evidence of a EF4 or greater. I think uh, uh, a considerable tag or a catastrophic tag works in those cases. I think the only wrong choice is to not upgrade the threat at all in these cases. Then the last thing is the, uh, the use of the tornado possible tag in severe thunderstorm warnings. Now, we, we've all had cases in our careers where we've kind of like, you know, there's a little bit of rotation there. We're not really sure it's going to produce a, a tornado, and but you end up slapping out a tornado warning anyway just, just, to, just to make sure you're covered. Uh, you know, and this is where most of our false alarms fall in this trying to, you know, trying to chase our tails a little bit for these uh, low-end brief spin-ups that, usually occur between the, the, uh, below the spatial and, and temporal resolution of the radar. Uh, we used to mandate, I'm sorry, mandate the, uh, uh, the phrase in, in our severe thunderstorm warnings when a tornado watch is in effect, the phrase that brief small tornadoes can and do occur. Uh, it's not mandated anymore in the central region. Uh, we've been given a waiver by headquarters. Uh, so now we can use the tornado possible tag at forecaster discretion, regardless of whether or not a, a tornado watch is in effect. And these are intended to be used for those weak spin up, brief spin-up cases uh, where it's somewhat possible but not likely uh, that a, a tornado is going to spin up. And a good example would be uh, a QLCS event with the, the shear vector oriented perpendicular to the orientation of the squall line, which you know, can produce these little brief little events that really don't do much damage. Uh, one of the things that we're also trying to emphasize in the IBW project is the polygonology, and uh, we're we're trying to you know make sure that we understand that uh, you know you're dealing with service issues. You you've got a customer, usually an emergency manager, who has a jurisdiction that they're they're responsible for, and so you need to be aware of county boundaries. Uh, they don't want uh, two tornado warnings when you can just give them one. So you just need to kind of be aware of kind of the county boundaries a little bit. Uh, also, trying to understand, uh, keep in mind storm motion. You don't want to, uh, you know, have a storm kind of propagate out of a box. So you need to be aware of, you know, right moving thunderstorms and things like that, and uh, the importance of editing the default polygon. And also, we want to be able to build confidence in using these tags. And then in summary, you know, what we're trying to do is improve communication of critical information. We want to be able to parse out the most valuable information. Uh, we want users to be able to prioritize the key warnings. You know, if you've got a whole bunch of tornado warnings out, um, but one of them is, has a considerable or catastrophic damage to the indicator tag, that allows the user to prioritize that key warning. Uh, also providing different levels of risk within the same product. And, uh, and enabling us to uh, to express a confidence level on potential impacts and risks. So that pretty much covers what the uh, what IBW is all about. And uh, I think it's, at best at this point, we'll we'll just kind of show a uh, um, an example of uh, of how this works in, in a in a warning situation. And this is the the Henryville. Indiana tornado of March 2nd last year, 2012. Uh, it's an EF4 tornado which which hit the city of Henryville, uh, which is about halfway through the damage path there, which is about 40, 45 miles long. And you can see it starts out in the EF1 and, and gradually builds up to a, uh, a stronger tornado of EF3 to EF4 intensity. 
And so we'll kind of step through this volume scan by volume scan, and we'll uh, compare the uh, um, what you see on the radar to the uh, uh, the graphic that you saw from the Smith study earlier on. So this is at 1933Z. This is uh, nearly 20 minutes before tornado touchdown. You can you can see here on the uh, on the right the uh, uh, storm relative velocity display where you've got uh, at the lowest elevation slice, which is right around 3,000 feet, uh, the, the beam center. Uh, you've got a convergent circulation, you know, nothing to get excited about, even though the, the reflectivity display looks pretty impressive. So we'll step ahead. And here's at 1937Z, rotational velocity is at about 29 knots. You can see that, you know, you, you've got a pretty good couplet there. Uh, uh, the broad scale circulation is still convergent, uh, but a pretty good coupler is developing there on, on the core of that. And uh, a tornado warning was issued by the Louisville office at about 1940Z, right after this. Um, rotational velocity, 29 knots, I've got here in the lower left. It, it's kind of hard to read that, but that is on the low end of, the, uh, of what you would expect of the EF, EF0 to EF1 scale with that kind of rotational velocity. We'll step ahead. One volume scan, which is 1942Z. You can see here uh, still, you know, broad scale convergence circulation, but it's getting pretty tight there in the uh, uh, in the mesocyclone core, and rotation of velocity has jumped up to 44 knots. Uh, and in this case, this is, might be an example where you might consider that con considerable damage threat indicator tag. And that is actually at the, uh, uh, the the little oval I've got there in the lower right. Actually, is indicative of uh, you know where you might be expecting an EF zero to EF one uh, tornado. Uh, I'm sorry, EF two to e EF one to EF two tornado to be forming. And this is at 1942Z, still uh, still prior to tornado touchdown by about eight minutes. Okay, next slide. Try that again. I'm not getting that forward, Crystal Lee. Just uh, freezing a little bit, Dick. Just wait a minute. Okay. I tried to take back control, but it's uh, going slow. A, a key aspect here is that these velocities, these rotational velocities, are an indication of the potential capability of that mesocyclone and what kind of tornadic uh, result it can support, as opposed to saying, you know, they're not necessarily a one-to-one -one correlation. What it's what it's suggesting then is based on that Smith study is that. When the mesocyclone contains this kind of rotational velocity, um, obviously when things are happening right, stretching processes are being maximized. That's partially why the low-level meso is developing the way that it is. It can is capable of supporting uh, tornadic uh, signatures and and results that are are more in line with these damage scales that that are lined up with. So. Obviously, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. That's why you see the spread within the study. But what it does give you an indication is is what the the low level mesocyclone is capable of of uh, supporting from a tornado perspective. And and that's why you see this predictive quality to it. Um, you know, this this you're seeing this rotational velocities in excess of 40 knots, even prior to tornado touchdown. But what it's giving you an indication is, is that once the tornado does occur, that the, the low-level mesocyclone is able to support a tornadic uh, circulation that is, that is um, much stronger in, in this instance, and in many instances, as the, the Smith study has shown. Okay, I've got the, the 1951Z slide up here, and you can see the rotational velocity has jumped up to 53 knots. And, and it's probably actually, you know, the tornado is, is just touched down and it's probably getting ready to produce uh, EF2 damage at this point. And I would, I would say that, you know, a considerable damage threat tag is, is definite. Uh, 
uh, should be strongly considered at this point. Um, and you can see that rotation is, you know, pretty strong. And at 53 knots, we're looking at the top end of the uh, EF2, maybe even low end of the EF3. And this is about seven minutes before EF3 damage is being produced on the ground. At this point here at 1956Z, it's really taken off, and the rotation of velocity is 71 knots. And, uh, you know, just probably, uh, certainly it's doing EF2 damage and probably getting ready to produce EF3 damage. This is at uh, uh, 2001Z, and uh, EF4 damage is start, going to be starting here at in a, in a couple of minutes, rotation of velocity. Is, uh, is 80 knots. You can see the debris ball forming there, uh, and you're actually, you know, at 80 knots, you're you're on the uh, definitely solidly in the EF4 uh, range on the Smith study. So at this point, you would you would clearly have a a, a considerable damage threat tag in effect, and we'll just kind of step through these five minutes later. Um, this slide here is 2010Z, and this is the point where uh, the Louisville office issued a tornado emergency for uh, uh, for Henryville, Indiana. Uh, you can see the uh, the velocity dropouts there, the deliasing, but there's definitely EF4 damage occurring as it hits Henryville at uh, at 2014Z. And a clear debris ball there on the uh, on the reflectivity signature. The same at 2014Z. Rotation of velocity is still 70 knots. And then it moves on. You can see the debris ball is starting to you know become a little bit removed to, from the uh, uh, from the main cell there. And it's starting at this point right here. The uh, uh, the low-level circulation start to lose its integrity a little bit, but it produces uh, EF3 plus, even a little bit of EF4 damage even uh, in the, the 15 minutes following this particular slide. And uh, I think we'll quit right there and open it up to questions. We've been going for 45 minutes. You got anything to add there, Greg? No, I, I think that the key is that even then the decay phase <clears throat> Excuse me. You, you see that the low level meso starts to disappear, but yet it's still producing, you know, significant tornado damage. And I think other studies have shown that as well. Is that there's this, for the same reason that you have predictive qualities leading up to it with a low level meso spinning up, um, and not having a tornado yet. In the same sense, with the low level meso spinning down, there's a lag while the tornado is still. You know, the tornado still has its angular momentum that it's preserving for a while, especially these large circulations. It takes a little while for them to spin down. All right, with that, we'll open it up to questions. Dick, it's uh, Dave Sills in King City today here. Hey, Dave. And, uh, yeah, really nice talk. Uh, a couple quick questions. How prevalent are sirens in central region and cities? And the second question is, if uh, if there was a QCLS tornado observed, uh, would you issue a tornado warning even though you're assuming it's going to be brief? Well, the first question is sirens are, are prevalent in most communities. Um, I, I really don't know of many that don't have them. Uh, they are expensive to maintain. Uh, the only city that I know of, large city, that doesn't have sirens is, is ironically, is Lubbock, Texas. Um, uh, but outside of that, I think, you know, it's it's generally pretty widespread practice to have sirens, and, and we work pretty well with our partners on those. Uh, as far as the second question, you know, if you have an observed tornado, I think probably the thing to do is to issue a tornado warning, even if you think it might be short-lived. You know, like Greg kind of explained a little bit how these things have their own kind of momentum. Um, you know, it's you hate to chase your tail, but you know, I, I guess it's it's a matter of forecast discretion. 
Yeah, a lot of times those reports come in, you know, brief spin-ups, the reports come in with some time lag, so you have to use that in consideration. Um, most of the time, you don't have somebody who's observing it and it's happening and they're on the phone with you at the, at the same time. So there's usually lag, and so it's a function of making sure that, you know, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's still the typical scenario, making sure that you don't have a missed event and a false alarm for a singular event. If it's a scenario, though, that looks like the situation is, is supportive for additional spin-ups to occur, um, then you, you have to take that into account. I, you know, this doesn't solve the brief spin-up problem. Um, the, those are just challenging problems anyway. Part of that is that there's a bit of, you know, there's not randomness to it, but from the radar observational perspective, there might be randomness because you're not able to see what's governing the, the spin-up process itself in the first place. Um, but if it looks like you're in a favorable location within the QLCS for continued production of um, mesocyclones or even you know smaller mesocyclones that can support something that lasts long, you know, you know, long enough that you have some confidence as to actually who it's going to impact, so you can provide some some added you know spatial and temporal value to the warning. Then you know, by all means, you know that's no different than than it is now. So. A lot of times I think those observed situations are you get the first tornado report and then you realize that you're in a situation that's capable of at least producing weak spin-ups and then you leverage that information um, from there on out, um, especially if whatever produced it might be gone. You don't want to chase that with a tornado warning on something that doesn't look like it can support something now. But, you know, when you, you, know, when you time track that back to when the the event occurred based on the report, you know, the evidence might be suggesting, well, okay, yeah, something might be possible there. Based on that signature, then we can leverage that for future warning decisions. Okay, so it sounds like the, the answer is kind of, it depends. Exactly. Yeah, in all these situations, I think it depends. Um, okay. Yeah. It's, it's a real issue, you know, we're, this is where most of our false alarms occur on this low end, right. the, the tornado intensity scale. And, uh, you know, that's something that we need to address. But IBW doesn't really address that. We would have liked it to, but one step at a time. So right now we're, we're kind of focusing on the, the high-end tornadoes with uh, this particular aspect of the project. Okay, thanks. Hi there, this is uh, Doug Benson. I'm at the Canadian Med Center in Montreal. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, a lot of uh, potentially far-reaching impacts on this, too. Uh, I was just curious to know if you got feedback from the public as to how people are reacting to these new tags. Well, we've had some, uh, our social science group has, has interviewed uh, mostly emergency managers and media, but there's, we've had some public feedback. And this year they're focusing on, uh, the group is focusing more on public feedback. Uh, the public feedback that we have gotten has been pretty positive. We, we had a, a large tornado hit Wichita, Kansas, actually a couple of them last year and so we, we did get positive feedback on uh, people responding to the uh, the higher end language that was in, the, in these warnings. Okay, just, thank just you. Just a little anecdotal evidence right there. Yeah, and part of the other aspect of the feedback is kind of an extension of the general public in this sense from the from the media. The media has, has stated that they're very um, they're very hopeful that this is going to provide them with that additional layer of information that helps them sort through situations where there may be a lot of warnings and this gives them um, more of a heads up as to which ones have, you know, the, the greatest likelihood of producing the, the, the most uh, impact on, on the populace as well. Because most people still leverage local media outlets for a lot of their information as well. So this, this helps them discern a little better and how they communicate information. Okay, good stuff. And from the from the forecaster's point of view, has there been have you had to do like a lot of training to get forecasters used to in uh, when to use these new tags as well? Go ahead, Greg. I'll let you handle that one. There's been a fair amount of training, um, but a lot of this is really boiled down to being able for the forecaster in many situations to communicate what they know and under the circum you know the setup that we had prior it was harder for them to communicate that that aspect so 
most of these situations, these higher end situations, these look different. They feel different. Um, we all know that because we've worked some of these events, you know, and it's one of those where it's, it's easier for them to, to communicate that without having to basically hand type new information that, that the end user might not even be expecting in the way that the, the warning was formatted prior. So essentially the, the, the warning itself has been framed in in such a way where it's easier for that information to be communicated and easier for the forecaster to communicate that information as well. Any other questions for Dick or Gray? Okay, thank you. I'm